Live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker. Negro in a morning show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hello, everybody. How you doing? It is Friday, May 11th, 2018. Time for another show. Things are awful as usual, so let's get started. <laughs> Doesn't that encourage you? Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of crazy things happening this morning. Twitter is aflame with 15 or so minor fires as compared to, say, the massive corruption of the president and everyone who surrounds him. But Daily Coast Radio is live now, so we'll take care of those things for you. Good news, Bill says, all the way from Portland, Maine. Kegro X, that's me, wishes you happy TGIF. Bad news? In this country, happy TGIF means absolutely nothing anymore. And, uh, well, it doesn't, it doesn't stand for anything, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Michael Cohen could change the definition of TGIF every five minutes and lie about the fact that he just called it something completely different. Lots of Michael Cohen news this morning. Lots of news about the news this morning. I don't know exactly. I'm not certain uh, anymore whether when people are retweeting one another's articles or tweets out there, whether they're doing so ironically or by way of endorsement or what anymore. But, uh, man, all sorts of craziness happening this morning in the journalism's world. I see Armando up in arms, rightfully so. On one front here, I guess, in, in which I guess... I don't think we mentioned it yesterday. And maybe it happened after the show ended yesterday, but... And, and I don't know who this person is either, but a, a White House staffer, a White House staffer was... Uh, I don't even know how to how to describe it. Uh, astonishingly disrespectful and, and rather disgusting in making fun of John McCain's impending death, which... You know, I haven't been particularly respectful about myself, but I, I'm not dancing around waiting for him to die. I mean, the, he's going to, and I think that's just sort of the... Well, everybody does, but uh, I guess his death is a little closer and more predictable than others because of the nature of the cancer he's suffering from. But, um, you know, and as we as we lionize him in uh, the biographies written about him, in anticipation of his death in the in the greater uh, mass media, I note for the record that there are some pretty serious deficiencies in filling out the record with respect to, of course, say his role in possibly creating Trump by nominating uh, or, or asking that Sarah Palin be nominated as his vice presidential candidate. He's expressed a lot of regret, apparently, about that. I haven't read any of it because naturally you're going to regret that. That's not actually all that revealing. So I haven't been reading about that. But, you know, any number of other things. Plus, of course, as we mentioned the other day, uh, something which I had forgotten about, his discussion during the 2008 presidential debate of uh, of of what he portrayed as fact, which is outrageous, that Acorn was somehow the greatest, actually the greatest threat to democracy that existed at the time. And this is an old cold warrior, I guess, speaking to you, uh, not me, but but uh, John McCain at the time uh, saying, yeah, you know, they're threatening to unravel democracy uh, and a massive voter fraud uh, 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 scheme on it underway. Which is just, I mean, I guess I, I see that happening the same way that the Palin nomination did. He's, you know, he, he's running a big operation, maybe too big for what he can handle. And somebody handed him the Sarah Palin thing and said, astonishingly enough, well, uh, those who were excited about possibly nominating Hillary Clinton for president and making her the first woman to run on a, uh, at the head of a major party ticket might be disgruntled, perhaps could be persuaded to vote for a Republican ticket if we put a woman on that ticket as vice president. And, I mean, the thinking was terrible. There's already been a woman nominated for vice president by one of the major parties. And guess what? It was the other major party 
and they thought it was serious and that they meant it and that they really genuinely thought that Geraldine Ferraro could and should be vice president of the United States, as opposed to the fairly transparent move here on, on, on this side. And it might not have been immediately obvious as transparent, although it really didn't take very long to figure out that that was the case. Uh, and you didn't even have to investigate Sarah Palin's record to know it. The moment he said, or the moment it was announced, I remember very clearly because I woke up to the news that morning uh, that Sarah Palin was the selection and everybody said, who the F and F is Sarah Palin? Well, she's the governor of Alaska. And I guess your first instinct is to say, All right, okay, govern, governor of a state. But usually, you know, you hear names once in a while. Alaska, it's far away, small state in terms of population. Who knows, right? But it, then like in 10 seconds of reviewing her record, there's nothing here. What are you talking about? Oh, this is, oh my gosh, it's a woman thing. And it, well, all right. I think that's awfully dumb. Uh, and it turned out to be awfully dumb and and. That's correct. And the same thing here. I don't have anything in the debate. What do you want to give me to use as a weapon? The Breitbart people are talking about this. They think it can catch fire. Go for it. Here you go. What do you care? You don't know what Acorn does and you don't care about them even if you did know. So just say it. So he did. Okay. Well, that's terrible. And I'm annoyed about that. Do I need him to die because of it? Who? What do I need for him to die for? He's going to anyway. I, I'm not excited about it one way or the other. Anyway, as it turns out, Ke Kelly Sadler, about whom I know nothing, is the White House aide who joked about it at some point, I guess, what in, in saying, uh, uh, in, in McCain expressing his opposition to Gina Haspel as CIA director. Whether or not he'll show up to vote against her is... I think I think the answer is no, but it was interesting to know. And so Kelly Sadler, to who, in what context, I don't know. It's here at CNN. I could take a look at it. Uh, basically said, who cares? You know, he's dying anyway. That's the joke, I guess. Ha <laughs> ha. Jim Acosta and Eli Watkins reported this one for CNN. And CNN means autoplaying video, which I'll have to wait for all the twirly things to stop so that I can... Shut it off. Nothing works, by the way, in terms of stopping auto playing video cold. I've had a lot of good suggestions about a lot of interesting ad blocking or tracker blocking software um, and or Chrome extensions. And uh, I'm very wary of all those things, for one thing. And uh, none of them really seem to do the job the way I want it to be done. Anyway, never mind that. We'll get back to that later. Jim Acosta and Eli Watkins reporting White House aide joked of dying McCain. Now, dying is in scare quotes, but he is dying. And as I said, we all are. We're all also falling towards the center of the Earth's orbit along with the planet. But, you know, relativity and we can ignore that. Uh, so here's the story. And by the way, once you stop CNN has, it's not a unique feature, but some of these websites that they put the, the video up at the top, you know, I think intuitively where it belongs. And then you scroll below it. I don't want to see the video. I want to see the text. You scroll down there and it, and then the video screen moves. It shrinks and it moves to the gutter, the side of the screen. And it's like, well, I scrolled past the video because I don't want to see it. No, you do. You must because you're here at CNN. Yeah, but if I wanted to see the video, I would turn on the television and watch the CNN there. We don't know that. And besides which, someone sold us this feature. So we're going to use it. White House aide Kelly Sadler. Anybody know anything about her? I actually don't. Uh, that she's a White House aide is news enough to me. Responded to Senator John McCain's opposition to President Donald Trump's pick for CIA director by saying Thursday morning, I guess it was happening during the show after all, he's dying anyway, a White House official told CNN. Now, who ran to the press with that one? The official said Sadler, who is in charge of surrogate communications, I gotcha. Meant it as a joke, but it fell flat. <laughs> that is tough crowd. Oh, I tell you. McCain announced last year that he's been diagnosed with brain cancer. You know all that. He issued the statement Wednesday. I, what else do you want to know? Sadler called the senator's daughter, Megan McCain, on Thursday to apologize for the remark. It's a good-ish thing to do. I mean, given that you've already done this uh, and it's a wash, you know, or it's a it's a sunk cost. You've already made the comment. You might as well call Megan McCain and apologize. 
Uh, the Hill first reported on Sadler's remark. How do you like that? That's maybe one of the first times that uh, reading another news source, somebody has pointed me back to The Hill and said, yeah, that's the original source. Congratulations to The Hill. McCain called Haspel a patriot in his statement, whatever, and uh, but still something, something, torture, yada, yada. And yes, I'm yada, yada torture. We all know about what happened there. Uh, that she doesn't deserve this promotion that uh, I reemphasize once again for the record, even if you believe that Gina Haspel has had some sort of epiphany on torture, she has not. And in addition to that, uh, how in the world anyone expects to conduct congressional oversight or any kind of oversight over someone who is about to be or could possibly be promoted for having violated a court order against the destruction of the evidence of torture. I don't have any idea. How are you going to get a person like that to answer questions? It's difficult enough to get the CIA to answer anything under normal circumstances, by which we mean, well, presumably, for the sake of argument, I guess, we say uh, under normal circumstances they're not torturing, though I don't know if that's really the case. But under normal circumstances... If there are any at the CIA, it's very difficult to get the CIA to answer questions that it is uncomfortable answering for good reason or bad if there's anything close to the color of national security claims to be pressed, to be to be offered up as a reason to not answer. But on top of that, somebody who has a demonstrated track record, i.e. they did it, of destroying evidence that was protected under court order so that they didn't get caught torturing. I have a hard time believing that person had an epiphany about torture in particular or about anything in general because what they've learned, if anything, there's an epiphany uh, about not getting caught or, you know, how to avoid serious trouble even if you violate bedrock constitutional principles. If I do that, I can just destroy the evidence of it and then they can't prove it against me and they can all think that about me, but they can't prove it and send me to prison. Ah, true, but what if the court is on to you and orders you to preserve that evidence? And the answer is, well, then I'll destroy it anyway. And when, you know, what's the court going to do? Come and beat me up? It's not going to do that. And at, at best, it will say it's, deeply troubled, as perhaps Senator Collins might put it, about the destruction of this evidence and uh, the court's inability to enforce its own mandates. She says there's no possibility of learning anything but that you should just do what you want, whether another branch says yay or nay. So uh, I don't know what to tell you. Members of Congress dig in their own graves when it comes to oversight if they approve of this nomination it's insane and i know there's lots of other calculations going on and uh, i was reminded this morning for instance that uh, this is you know part of the reason why senators like joe manchin and i don't know where's uh, heidi heitkamp and all this right they, they they're running campaigns in red states and in red states people think donald trump really wants these people in the job and he kind of sort of does for the moment he has no he, he doesn't care He has no serious preference. He wants to win, and if Gina Haspel or any other one of his nominees loses, then he wants the next one to win, and he doesn't care whether it's one person or the other. But that's enough for the MAGA types in these red states, and so I guess there are certain candidates who want to be seen as sometimes, quote, working with the president. But, you know, it's also, quote, shooting yourself in the foot, Because to the extent that you think that part of the job of Congress is to conduct oversight, you're signing the death warrant of oversight. But that's not top on Joe Manchin's list. Well, top on Joe Manchin's list is getting back to the Senate, and that's got to be worth something. Uh, It it would be nominally better to have, and you know, I, I think a better, fuller examination would say, all right, it's not. It's better than nominally better to have. A D, any D in that seat than any R. And we could quibble about how much better. And you might get me to finally concede it's it really is only nominally better. But 
if you really sit down and look at the the every single vote, not just in general or uh, on key votes or that guy pissed me off. Yes, you'll find that it's better to have a D there than an R. There could be better Ds and there might even be better Ds that you could elect to that seat in a perfect world where you got a, you know, an open shot at it and everybody's running, you know, uh, uh, from the same standpoint and it's not an incumbency tinged contest and it's not taking place, say, against the background of virulent and uh, uh, widespread white supremacy or nationalism. But uh, since that's not happening, OK, you get the point, I think. Anyway, uh, I thought very interesting and all that. And it was really just another opportunity to remind you that there are going to be, if Gina Haspel is installed, you'll have one very specific example of it. And it probably exists elsewhere. And the, the, the administration is probably full of people serving at the cabinet level and certainly slightly below cabinet level who just believe that they're entitled to do whatever the hell they want. I have no doubt, for instance, that Scott Pruitt would destroy evidence of his own guilt, whether under court order to preserve it or not. And he's probably not even close to the only one. And I got to believe that Donald Trump himself has been involved in such things, or at least had his people involved in such things. I'm sure uh, untold, uh, the untold tales of destruction of evidence in the Trump organization and around Donald Trump's personal life even is uh, probably astonishing and could fill volumes all by itself. Okay, so uh, let's see. Where else uh, might we head with all this? Pocket is full of stuff. Twitter full of stuff. Um, Oh, yes. Also this morning, lots of reaction to, I guess, uh, was it the Axios guys put together some sort of uh, response to the story we were discussing yesterday. It's been a lot of backlash to the coverage of, of the story of shadow lobbying. Remember we were discussing that and I forget whose piece it was that we were reading. And I was, uh, uh, I started off by saying, yeah, you know, this sort of stuff does happen. This really is something of a widespread phenomenon. And I think that was picked up and run with by Axios, later on about uh, in a fashion of of like savviness you know oh, everybody knows this goes on it's not a big deal the michael cohen uh, arrangements are not unusual i think they are unusual but they are right in that lots of this shadow lobbying goes on and i i, I think i correctly described for you yesterday it's it's typically engaged in by one uh people who are actually qualified and really do you know know the slang around Washington and elsewhere, of course, is that uh, the, you, know, you want people who, quote, know where the bodies are buried. And that's usually taken as a metaphor, <laughs> you see, for knowing how things operate in Washington, D.C., knowing how you can leverage certain people, for instance, uh, knowing which buttons to push is a nicer way of saying it in order to make things happen. Michael Cohen knows where the bodies are buried, but I think it's not a metaphor. He knows where they've actually buried bodies of people they've murdered along the way. And that's interesting and stuff, but it's not going to help Novartis any uh, shadow lobbying arrangements are usually of some benefit a to the people paying for it. And B they, usually involve, as we said, some people who are who have specific reason to avoid registering as lobbyists. And the reasons are not necessarily as nefarious, let's say, as those that it seems Michael Cohen uh, was, you know, interested in. Uh, it's nefarious in that it's it's lying and it's deceitful. For instance, I gave you the example of, in all likelihood, uh, Rick uh, Santorum would be involved in such things. And any number of people who are perennial candidates or discussed as candidates for president would likely be in such an arrangement if they're not in an official elected position at the moment. It's a great way to uh, either shake down various industries or, you know, more likely to collect 
a healthy salary, more than healthy salary from uh, industry giants who have cash to spare, but without having to register as a lobbyist and therefore be accused of being a lobbyist, horror of horrors, in any future debate. So that's, uh, well, that's one of the differences, I guess, and that uh, it's just of a different kind. Like Michael Cohen, though he does have, I mean, you would argue in court that the guy has an electoral background. He's run for office in, in New York City. In the past, he's, he was destroyed. He never got anywhere close to uh, winning a race or even being nominated. But I guess, you know, if you're in court uh, and you're on trial, you point at that and say, well, you know, you don't know that I'm not going to run for office in the future. And therefore, I am trying to avoid the label of lobbyist for that reason. But uh, there was no reason, you know, usually in the shadow lobbying situations, there's no real reason for the people paying the money to worry about paying lobbyists. They already pay lobbyists. They pay plenty of them. And it's no skin off their nose to pay someone else as a lobbyist. But, you know, they want to help out. They want to pay somebody some money and support them while they're casting about for another job. But uh, they, you know, and, and they're willing to cough up the money, but uh, it's not happening for whatever reason, or the person isn't able to accept it uh, as a lobbyist because they're trying to hide from that label, and that's all that goes on. So they don't care about you know what you call yourself. We'll pay you either way. We'll facilitate that uh, that fiction if you want, but uh, you know it, it, it's it's makes no difference to us. Uh, here, Michael Cohen is, of course, looking to get paid off without uh, um, uh, not only being identified as a lobbyist, but without any, having anybody see the money and uh, know where it's coming from or why it's coming to him. And that way he can keep it for himself uh, and or pass it on, I guess, to uh, to Donald Trump without having it be watched or traced or without having to explain why he says he's worth $100,000 a month or whatever. And so it's, it is. It's different in kind. So, uh, I mean, I guess I'll find it again during the break. But, uh, yeah, the Axios guys uh, apparently ticked off everybody else this morning by saying, uh, you know, this stuff happens. And besides which, if it didn't happen, a lot of you readers of our column who live in your McLean, that is McLean, Virginia, uh, right outside of Washington, D.C., live in your McLean McMansions or drive your BMW or eat your steaks at, what was it, BLT Steakhouse? Is that, uh, uh, is that the Trump place? Uh, anyway. Uh, the point is, if you're living the high-flying Washington, D.C. lobbyist lifestyle, a lot of that wouldn't be possible without deals like this one, except, of course, it is possible. There's plenty of registered lobbyists who live just like that and simply tell you who's paying them, and it's fine. But even so, even if that were not the case, it's uh, it's ticked people off because it's another one of those Church of the Savvy moments. And... Uh, reveals to everybody that, uh, wink, wink, a lot of the Washington, D.C. press corps thinks the people who are shocked by such things are the rubes and idiots and, and don't deserve to be, you know, don't deserve the truth. Hey, you're too dumb to understand that this is happening all the time. Yeah, I, I understand the inclination, but it's a good scoop. It's a good story, and you know people are eating it up. Why do you turn away from that? If you're driven by clicks and and traffic, et cetera, and there's a huge spike of interest in this thing, why wouldn't you treat it seriously? I have no idea. Anyway, uh, let's see. Plenty of other uh, stories that would, uh, I think, interest you for the weekend, and uh, plenty more on Giuliani. And here's an interesting story. Let's see. This one probably fits in in the break. There's not too much to it. Uh, what's her name here? Kirsten Nielsen, the... Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, yes, seriously. Uh, you forgot that, probably. She, uh, according to the New York Times, almost resigned after a Trump tirade. Michael Shear and Nicole uh, Perlroth reporting this piece yesterday. 
We all feel bad for Secretary Nielsen, I'm sure. Uh, She told colleagues she was close to resigning. Oh, no. After President Trump berated her on Wednesday in front of the entire cabinet for what he said was her failure to adequately secure the nation's borders. According to several current and former officials familiar with the episode, it is kind of a funny situation because it's like, what the hell did you think you were getting into, you dope? On the one hand, and on the other hand, well, then nobody really deserves that. But then going to work for Trump, that's just the job description. You're going to be berated for stuff that might or might not have anything to do with you whatsoever. And the fact that you're a woman, sure, that absolutely might have contributed to it. He's very open about that. Uh, it's an amazing he didn't grab you in certain ways now that uh, that's out in the open. Ms. Nielsen, as she's described here, is a protege of John F. Kelly. Do you know him? He's the White House Chief of Staff. Oh, my goodness. Uh, the alarm way up loud, no matter how many buttons I press. And uh, believe me, I spent a lot of time trying to make sure that the volume was down on the iPhone. One of the most annoying things about these iPhones is you turn them on and say, I got to turn down the volume so that when the alarm goes off, it doesn't ring audibly on the show, even though it actually happens anyway, even when the buzzing is audibly. I'm getting so distracted this morning, I tell you. Uh, so you you press that those buttons and you watch the volume go down, 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 right in front of your eyes, but it's the ringer that you have to be worried about, not the volume. It's a totally separate thing, and they should really not keep it that way. And they should make it different. Okay, well, at any rate, as we uh, head off into our first two-minute break, we will resume with the sad sob story of Kirsten Nielsen, who got yelled at by Donald Trump for something that might or might not actually be her fault, and she almost resigned but didn't. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGO in the Morning, interrupting this little break to say thanks so much to all of you who are contributing supporters of KGO in the Morning. Thousands of you are downloading the show each day, but fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners are donating to help keep us on the air. For the money you'd spend on a single three-minute iTunes song, we bring you two hours of great news and entertainment every day, five days a week. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com makes it easy. You can find us there by searching KGRO X or David Waldman or KGRO in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box and you'll be right where you need to be to make easy, recurring, monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your support. Good morning and welcome back to the K-Girl in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I uh, did find over the break the, uh, the, 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 what do we call it? The reporting from Axios, I guess. Is it Axios? Oh, it's Politico. I'm sorry. <laughs> I blamed uh, Axios, but it might as well be the same. It's, it's pretty much the same group of people. Uh, Katie Tour, I guess, uh, raising the alarm today with this tweet that says, Politico not mincing words on the realities of money in Washington this morning. Also, Cohen, and I guess we're talking about this bit here, that uh, screen grabs of which read, Good Friday morning and welcome to the reality of Washington. In the last two days, we've seen the world get introduced to two elements of D.C. that many of us know well, a political intelligence and big dollar fundraising. Here are a few things that happen in D.C. that might but shouldn't catch some people by surprise. Yes, Paul Ryan flew across the country to meet with Sheldon Adelson, and when the Super PAC asked for $30 million, he had to leave the room. Yes, it's weird. That's how campaign finance works. That's They can do everything but ask for the big dough. Happens routinely in both parties. That was a story we have not yet touched on, but it is an interesting one, and you have likely heard it by now. And uh, basically the story is... Uh, the big Republican tax cut resulted in some 637, is it? Uh, 600 and something million dollar windfall, I think in the first quarter, for Sheldon Adelson's companies. And so they asked for some of that money to be kicked back to the House Republican Super PAC. He cut him a check for $30 million 
which is a drop in the bucket of just not forget what he actually has, but $30 million is just a drop in the bucket of the windfall tax break that he got in the first quarter. And so we're into the very vicious cycle that probably everybody who ever worried even for a second, even if they later dismissed those thoughts about big money and politics uh, hypothesized right away. What if the Congress simply gives money to some party, whether individual or some class of people, and then just shakes them down for some portion of it back in order to keep them in office and generating similar breaks over and over again. It's a self-funding machine. Yeah, it's true, and here it is. Uh, I was actually interested in their take a little bit, as I mentioned, on the Michael Cohen thing. Yes, guys like Michael Cohen routinely get paid amounts like $1.2 million to offer insights. Hmm about their boss or former boss. Yeah, it's crazy, but many readers of this newsletter would not have their McMansion in McLean. I don't have one, and I don't read this newsletter, uh, except when it's tweeted around for me. Their BMW, haven't got one of those either. Their membership at Army-Navy, now, not uh, no, uh, no on that one too. Army-Navy, uh, it's a country club. It's, uh, it's a armed forces country club. Golf, you play golf there, and was traditionally... The place to do such a thing, the place to be seen playing golf because you were a power lobbyist and you were doing that with members of Congress, sometimes the president of the United States, et cetera, et cetera. But now the new president of the United States has his own place and you have to pay him directly in order to get there. Uh, wouldn't have second homes in Delaware. I don't have any homes in Delaware, but hey. Cigar lockers, no. Endless glasses of Pinot Noir, no. At BLT Steak and Tosca, no. If that kind of stuff didn't happen. There you go. Newsflash, $1.2 million is not even a rounding error for massive corporations. The smart companies route these deals through law firms. They do, but there's lawyers at those law firms, and the lawyers through whom they are routed are genuine practitioners of something, as opposed to Michael Cohen, who is not. And generally speaking, they're able to deliver on the promise of this stuff by telling them something worthwhile. It then goes on to say a scintilla of information gives a company an edge. That price tag would be completely worth it for a member of Hill leadership and Intel on what? I can't even read this now. Uh, there's how do I get rid of the uh, the text that's in the way? All right. Well, at any rate, uh, it, it was an extraordinarily like jaded look at uh, lobbying and the big money and the big price tags and uh, it, there's but there's no hint that Michael Cohen was able to even give that scintilla of information. It says goes on to say though Intel on Trump is worth much more than that. Uh, it seems like Cohen offered squat. See Washington Post story on Cohen advising AT and T on the Time Warner merger. Uh, yes, people work for years on the Hill for $60,000 to make three times as much money on K Street to work much shorter days. Uh, it, that, that's pretty nice. Uh, back in the days when I worked on the Hill for years to do that sort of thing, it was for in the neighborhood of $25,000, now $60,000. I'd take it. And guess what? Random 24-year-old Hill aide, they don't like you for your personality. You're boring and green. They want to know what your boss is talking about, what he's worked up about. And what he's thinking about on Random Bill X. Yes, people pay for access. It's called a fundraiser. Why do you think many restaurants in D.C. have five private rooms? Why do you think some companies buy massive townhouses on Capitol Hill and put the EPA administrator in it? Why do you think members of Congress hold pack retreats at swanky resorts and lobbyists go in droves? It ain't for the camaraderie. Yes, all of the people who say they are against the system participate in it. Yes, the people who rage against the machine are greasing the skids. Watch cable TV. Look for a lawmaker who says the system is broken and then take a gander at their campaign finance report. Bet you they have tons of PAC contributions and tons of lobbyists giving them dough. Hmm. And no, the swamp is not drained. Give us a break. We're not defending the status quo. Yes, you are. But welcome to reality. This is the campaign finance lobbying government system Congress created and D.C. fostered, uh, all of which has uh, some level of truth in it. So fine. It seems to be interesting to people. Why not report on it and do it in a way that doesn't sneer at people who are interested in it? I don't know, but that's always been the big problem over at, uh, well, the entire DC media establishment. That's not a surprise to you, I know. 
All right, let's see a couple of comments that have come in before we return to the Kirsten Nielsen story. Uh, let's see, what have we here? Michael Musson commenting, how about the company paying the other lobbyists $10,000 a month and then paying Cohen $100,000 a month for nothing? Yes, that is a quantum difference. You're right. And it's amazing that they didn't take the opportunity to point that out. I think that's odd. Uh, let's see, or Trump opposing the AT&T merger and AT&T injecting money into the Trump circle to change his mind. Trump does say how impressed he is with Putin. Yes. Uh, although, you know, I mean, I, I, I guess you could, uh, you, you might toss that example and just say, you know, lobbying sometimes works, but, uh, certainly the, uh, the, the quantum difference is an issue. The fact that Michael Cohen is a terrible lawyer and has absolutely nothing to say on any issues or really even, uh, being able to understand or explain Donald Trump any better than the rest of us, I would guess. And, uh, I guess it, it only took a little while for Novartis to figure that one out. So, all right, well, there's lots of, uh, uh, nonsense around here okay let's see uh oh some more advice too on <laughs> uh some various extensions that kill autoplay i don't know I, I should stop worrying about autoplaying video it doesn't seem to get in our way other than annoying me all right kirsten nielsen boohoo she got yelled at by donald trump uh long story short here is one that comes with the territory and you should realize it and two uh, funny because Donald Trump yells at her for something that might not really even be tops in her portfolio anyway. <clears throat> and also funny because of, you know, just how, I don't know, how dumb the guy is. Let's uh, run through a couple of the details here. There was a lengthy tirade, apparently, uh, in which the president railed at his cabinet about what he said was its lack of progress towards sealing the country's borders against illegal immigrants, according to one person who was present at the meeting. Um, again, you're going to have to picture the toddler mind of Donald Trump sitting at this thing. And he's supposed to be president of the United States, and he's angry because people are still coming across the border. Like, it's not sealed. And of course, you know, in his mind, he thinks building a wall will seal it. Like, no one will ever defeat the wall. I don't think that's the case, but I guess he thinks so. And, uh, oh, uh, I would imagine that you could see, for instance, uh, contractors being retained by the federal government to build the wall. And as soon as somebody crosses the border anyway, Donald Trump in, in, in his private business practice would, of course, then say, ah, I'm not going to pay you for your work on the wall or I'll pay you, you know, pennies on the dollar because I asked you to build a wall that would seal the border and someone got across anyway, so not paying you. Now, there will be holes, of course, doors even, where people and, let's say, vehicles that are authorized to cross the border would be allowed to cross the border. And I, you know, Donald Trump is the kind of person who would order the wall built that way and in private business and then get the wall built that way. And people who were intended to be allowed through the border would be allowed through the border. And he would nonetheless point to that anyway and say, it's not sealed. I asked for a wall that would seal the border and this is not sealed. Look at it. There's a door. But you asked for the door. Yes. And I wanted the door sealed. No, you didn't. I mean, that's that's the only thing you can say to the guy. And he would nonetheless, you know, he's just using it as an excuse not to pay. Now, that's a sideshow to all of this. But, uh, you know, imagine the president of the United States. You don't have to imagine it really happened. Sitting in a cabinet meeting saying an individual person got through the, you know, the border. It's It's outrageous and being angry about it and being legitimately angry about it and railing about it in front of the cabinet. And then singling out, you know, I mean, the the immigration service, ICE, as we now call it, is not cabinet level. So they're not going to be sitting there. They're a bureau of I don't even know who. Um, but I mean, are they under uh, I, I don't even know how it's organized. I imagine 
uh, yeah, there we are. Uh, the As head of the Department of Homeland Security, Ms. Nielsen is in charge of the 20,000 employees who work for the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency. So, I mean, it's under her purview. But, it, but the idea that, like, you right here, uh, I keep wanting to call her Bridget Nielsen. <laughs> she is, of course, Kirsten Nielsen, totally different blonde Nielsen. And uh, it's true. There's at least two of them. And uh, but holding her personally accountable, like she's going to be standing out there with, you know, spray foam insulation, patching leaks in the wall that doesn't exist. Mr. Trump's anger toward Ms. Nielsen, who was sitting several seats to his left at the meeting, was part of a lengthy tirade in which the president railed at his cabinet about what he said is a lack of progress towards sealing the country's borders against illegal immigrants. Now, he'll leave that meeting. And do this again, just as he has before that meeting. We're making great progress in sealing the borders against the tidal wave of illegal immigrants from Mexico and other terrible places where they're all rapists. Whatever. Uh, you know, and then go into the private meeting. We're making terrible progress. People keep coming to this country. Eh? It's going to happen. Wall, no wall geodesic dome over the whole country, whatever you want to talk about, people are going to come. And she's, he's still going to be yelling at this. Anybody who occupies this position, we're making, we have a lack of progress. You just said progress was great. I was lying. What's wrong with you? Asked about the heated exchange at the meeting, Sarah Huckabee Sanders lied horribly, probably, I'm sure, uh, said Thursday that the president is committed to fixing our broken immigration system. That is a lie. That's true. And our porous borders. And that too. In a statement, Ms. Nielsen said she intended to, quote, continue the continue to direct the department to do all we can to implement the president's security focused agenda. Mumbo jumbo, whatever. She said Mr. Trump was rightly frustrated that existing loopholes and the lack of congressional action have prevented this administration, his administration, from fully securing the border. OK, he's rightly angry about that. Sure, whatever. Uh, Tyler Q. Holton, it's a real name, a spokesman for the Department of Homeland Security, disputed that Ms. Nielsen had drafted a resignation letter and was close to resigning, calling those assertions false, which I guess means that Ms. Nielsen wants them to be called false. I think that's interesting. What an interesting dynamic that I don't know. And so that's as somebody said yesterday, that's part and parcel of working for the Trump administration is keep trying to resign and then deny that you're trying to resign. That's the way you spend most of your time. This is the part I thought was kind of uh, funny when we get down to this section. Mr. Trump's anger about immigration has grown in recent weeks, like everything else about him. According to several officials, he repeatedly claimed credit for the fact that during the first year of office, illegal border crossings dropped to their lowest level in decades. But this year, they have risen again. Oh, my goodness. Wait, I they must have a sound effect for that somewhere. Robbing him of one of his favorite talking points. No, it doesn't rob him of his favorite talking point. That's a mistake. He will say that it's at its lowest level in decades anyway. And Daniel Dale and the rest of us will have to point out, no, they aren't. That's a lie. And then we'll all be all frustrated again. So, no, uh, the frustration can't be from robbing him of one of his favorite talking points. Nothing can rob him of one of his favorite talking points. Nothing. It doesn't have to be true or even near true to remain a favorite talking point. In remarks to reporters before Wednesday's meeting, Mr. Trump hinted, at, ang at the anger that would cause him to erupt once TV cameras were let out of the room. I'm surprised he didn't do it right in front of it. We have very much toughened up the border, but the laws are horrible, Mr. Trump said. The laws in this country for immigration and illegal immigration are absolutely horrible. And we have to do something about it. Not only the wall, which we're building sections of the wall right now. They're not, see? I told you. One person familiar with Mr. Trump's blow up at the meeting, said it was prompted by a discussion about why Mexico was not doing more to prevent illegal border crossings into the United States. Because what do they care? I don't know. Another person said the president was primarily focused on the Homeland Security Department because he viewed Ms. Nielsen as primarily responsible for keeping illegal immigrants out of the country. Now, it's true that ICE does reside under Homeland Security. But, I mean, Homeland Security, I think, 
was created uh, at least in, well i don't know i mean uh, i guess we'd have to look at the authorizing statute but my recollection of course was that uh, the chief mission at the time was terrorism prevention as opposed to immigration control now they do go hand in hand in some ways of course if you are a foreign actor and you want to act in the united states as a terrorist you're going to have to cross the border to enter the united states not necessarily i don't know if i would necessarily classify it as immigrate to the united states but certainly you would be a concern to ice uh, as you try to enter the country for whatever reason and under whatever pretense. So, yes, uh, you're going to have to watch the borders as part of the anti-terrorism mission. But uh, uh, there you go. Another person said the president was primarily focused on homeland security because he views homeland security as primarily responsible for keeping illegal immigrants out of the country. And it probably I'd read it that way as opposed to it's the Homeland Security primarily, the primary Homeland Security Department that is responsible for keeping illegal immigrants out of the country. And that is true because ICE was parked there. During the meeting, Mr. Trump, this is, this is the, the part that really killed me. During the meeting, Mr. Trump yelled about the United States' porous border. I'm bad about the porous border. He yelled about the United States' porous border and said more needed to be done to fix it. This, again, the genius that we allegedly elected to be president of the United States. What's your agenda? I want to stop the porous border. More needs to be done to fix it. Well, you're now atop the greatest and farthest reaching, most powerful, best funded bureaucracy in the world. What do you want to do? I want to stop the thing. Uh, you know, uh, we'll, I want to build the wall. Well, you just said we're already building the wall. Well, we're not building it fast enough. Well, you just said you're making tremendous progress. Well, some other thing about it, basically. That's he sits there, and this is what he envisioned the presidency as being all about, because this is how he ran the Trump organization. I want a thing done about the thing. You got to do a thing, and we're not doing the thing fast enough. Do more things. That's, that's basically it. It's up to everybody else to figure out what are those things. In some ways, that's an accurate description of the presidency, but usually they're able to articulate just a wee bit more about those things or or people at lower levels are able to do it for them. And here we have a problem. Nobody's able to articulate anything. So there you go. I don't like the porous border. More needs to be done to fix it. But the border will always be porous. That's just the nature of borders. It doesn't have it could be more or less porous. People have to be able to cross the border. And that's just what comes up when members of his cabinet pointed out that the country relies on day laborers who cross the border each day. Mr. Trump said that was fine, but continued to complain. One person said, so this is this is the dynamic of what goes on in cabinet meetings. I don't like the porous border. I want the border sealed. I can't be any clearer about this. This is why we wanted to build a wall. In fact, the wall, I'm already building it. I'm already building it. It's fantastic. It's, you know, but it's porous. I don't know. People are crossing the border. I want that stopped. But, Mr. President, people have to be able to cross the border. I know, and that's fine. But I also don't know, and that is not fine. Do you understand me? Do I make myself clear? That's essentially what's happening here. Uh, now, so, of course, Kristen Nielsen threatens to resign, slash does not threaten to resign, and denies that any of this ever came about. During the meeting, Mr. Trump yelled about all this stuff. He need, more needs to be done to fix it, but people have to be able to cross the border. That's fine, but I'm still angry. The president also complained about continuing the continued failure of his administration to find a way to build a wall along the southern border with Mexico. Two people familiar with the episode said, we're already building the wall, which I can tell you, and I am angry that we're not building the wall, which I also will tell you that. Anyway, Ms. Nielsen viewed the president's rant as directed mostly at her, and she told associates after the meeting that she should not continue. She should not continue in the job if he did not view her as effective. She should not continue in the job, no matter what his view is. One person close to Ms. Nielsen said she was miserable in her job. And once again, wah, 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 I'll just do the sound effect myself. Who freaking cares? I hope you're miserable for the rest of your life. Anybody who facilitates this regime ought to be miserable for the rest of their lives. Anyway, uh, I thought this was somewhat revealing too down here. 
Mr. Trump has clashed with Ms. Nielsen for weeks about his belief that more should be done to secure the border. What should we do? In early April, the president repeatedly expressed frustration. I'm so frustrated. I'm so frustrated. I'm so frustrated. That's how it goes. With Ms. Nielsen, that her department was not doing enough to close loopholes that were allowing illegal immigrants into the country, according to one official familiar with those discussions. And again, you can just imagine how this is going. Mr. President, we're doing everything we can. We'll close some loopholes. Well, like Specifically, do you have any idea like what loopholes you're talking about? Have you heard of any loopholes that anger you? There's loopholes. And of course, this comes from his having been briefed not by issue area experts, but by television, watching Fox and Friends. And Fox and Friends will say, there's so many loopholes. How, what ones are there? How do you know that they exist? Why do they exist? What, what can be done to close them? None of this is answered because, well, in some cases, because there's no loopholes or because the loopholes are the ones that they're talking about. What well, people need to be able to cross the border each day. I know that's fine. That's a loophole. But that's a fine loophole. I want the other ones, the non-fine loopholes closed. What, which ones? What are you talking about? I don't know. I heard there was loopholes. That's the bottom line of how he, how he governs. I heard many people are saying, whatever it is, whatever the excuse, that I can tell you there are loopholes. Okay, there's not, but that's what you say. I, and, and I guess I'd quit the job too, except she's not going to because whatever. She's that dumb, I guess. In early April, the president expressed repeated frustration. Not enough doing, not enough closing of loopholes. So during those discussions, officials had presented Mr. Trump with a list of proposals that would help border agents crack down on those trying to cross the border illegally and send them back more quickly. The president urged Ms. Nielsen to be more aggressive, the official said. One persistent issue Here's here's the sort of thing that he wants. This is, these are the loopholes I heard about on TV. One persistent issue has been Mr. Trump's belief that Ms. Nielsen and other officials in the department were resisting his direction that parents be separated from their children when families cross illegally into the United States, several officials said. Now, everybody says, oh, my gosh, you know, this is a humanitarian issue here. I mean, OK, look, they're crossing the border illegally. I, I, and OK. If we all concede this, right, you, you arrest them, you're going to detain them and deport them. But there's no particular reason to split the parents off from the children, particularly extremely young children, except that there is a reason. And the reason has basically been made up on television. And here's the thing. The, the, well, sure. Why shouldn't we split them up? Because what they did was illegal. It was wrong. And we should punish them for doing it. And we should make an example of them. And this is, I mean, I should just read on. But this is what happens in, in when policymaking, to the extent that this is being made as policy, uh, is driven by angry television. Well, we can't just split them up just for the hell of it, just to make things worse. Why not? Why not? Because it's all happening on television and they don't care what the real life consequences are. They want revenge against people. people keep coming across the border and and we build a wall and they're still coming well why don't we you know essentially what they're saying is why don't we pull their fingernails out why don't we smack them in the face with a ball peen hammer that'll make them change their minds well because it's horrible cruel unnecessary unjust um uh, at the moment contrary to policy well make it uncontrary to policy this is what's this is what is driving all of this so Again, this is a persistent issue. Trump's belief that Nielsen and other officials are resisting his direction that parents be separated from their children. Why? To what end? To punish, to deter people from crossing the border. They won't cross the border if they know that we'll take their kids away from them. That's literally it. The president and his aides in the White House have been pushing a family separation policy, not just a policy that is no longer helpful in preventing the separation of families, but a policy of separating families. For weeks, they've been pushing this as a way of deterring families from trying to cross the border illegally. You want your you want a television ad about this one? Show the footage of the Nazi extermination camps pulling children out of line, children and women on this side and the men on that side and separating the families. Why are we doing it? Are we saying they're Nazis? Oh, 
heaven for friends. No, we're not saying they're Nazis. But what's the purpose of separating the, the families? It's quite explicit here. Trump and his loons think people will seek less freedom if one of the consequences is that we will purposely torture you with separation of your family. Nice. You want to pray for somebody's death? Make it Donald J. Trump. Don't waste your time praying for John McCain's death. It's coming. So is Donald Trump's, but you might as well get ready to enjoy that one. Because I will. On Monday, Justice Department officials announced that border agents will refer 100% of illegal crossings for prosecution. Sure, why not announce that? It is not true, but why not announce it? A decision that will almost like will most likely result in more family separations. It's just like, you know, I want the border sealed. Well, people do have to cross and they will cross. I know that's fine, but I don't want that to happen. Well, uh, I want 100% of illegal crossings prosecuted. Well, we can't do that because, for instance, suppose we arrest somebody and they die in custody. Maybe we kill them in custody. That person won't be prosecuted for their illegal crossing. Well, I don't care. Uh, you prosecute the corpse, he might say. Or that one's fine. It's okay. So what are we going to do? It's not going to be 100%. We're going to be lying. Who cares? I lie all the time. Go say 100%. All right. Uh, from now on, 100% of illegal crossings will be prosecuted. Uh, but isn't that untrue? Uh, 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 smoky eye, something. I have to leave now. I, you know. That's just the way it's going to be handled. One official said the family separation issue is just one part of the president's broader frustration. Can you imagine he'd, he'd be broader about anything? A uh, broader frustration with the pace of progress on an immigration crackdown. We're making tremendous progress. We're fantastic and great, but I'm frustrated because we're not making any progress. Which was a central promise that he made to voters during his 2016 presidential campaign. Now, those of you paying attention to the news today will also note, of course, just a little diversion here, that uh, he has reversed course on the idea of having uh, Medicare and other large uh, government procurers negotiate drug prices with manufacturers, except he changed his mind about that one, but that doesn't count. Welcome back now to the Kegel in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I think... I think we're going to jump back out of this article. There's more to read. I encourage you, of course, on your own time to uh, read the rest of the article because there are many more things. Look, there's a lot more things that we could uh, poke fun at the president's inconsistencies with in here. And, oh, I'm so frustrated and I'm going to do something horrible to people to show how frustrated I am. Uh, or more dumb rhetoric. We're going to start defending our country. We're going to start defending our borders, et cetera, et cetera. Sure, you know, whatever. It's the sort of thing you go around saying and then you don't do anything in particular because he's, he's a, a big, lazy doofus and he has no idea what to do and neither does anybody else because there's no satisfying the guy and he's shooting for pie in the sky. He wants to be able to get cheers at rallies when he says things and the things that get cheers are we're going to defend our board we're going to have 100 percent secure borders we're never going to have that it's ridiculous to even say it's like saying i'm going to go to the golf course and i'm going to hit a hole in one on every shot which by by which i assume he means <laughs> the, the guy i just made up i assume what he means is uh okay i'm going to have a hole in one on every on every hole I'm going to score an 18. Now, you're not going to, but you want to be able to say you did or that you're going to or we're going to be working very hard towards it. Get the cheers, whatever. And you know, it's an impossible thing to do. It wouldn't even be golf if that's how things happen. But why not say it if people cheer for it? We're going to have 100% border security. And then you won't. And then you have a cabinet meeting. And it's not, I bet it's not even that he's really frustrated about the porousness of the border or the lack of progress or anything of the kind. And this is where we're still, I, I guess, even the most uh, skeptical reporters 
people who really give Trump a hard time still, I still don't think everybody understands exactly where it's not like I do. There's no understanding the guy. He's mercurial because he's a, 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 a dotard, like they said. And and by the way, Kim Jong Un is a fantastic guy, and he treats everybody, including hostages, wonderfully. He said I was a dotard, but I love him. Here, have some chocolate cake. It's terrific. Uh what's happening in this guy's mind is I think he arrives at a cabinet meeting. Oh God damn it! Another one of these things. Are you serious? All right, fine, whatever. I'm the boss. I'm not worried about it. Like the normal person who does no work would be like, shoot, I'm sad. careful. All right. Another cabinet meeting. God damn it. These things come up all the time. I don't have anything. I don't have anything to say. Right. What am I going to do? They're going to find out I'm a fraud. Not Donald Trump. Don't worry about it. I'm the boss. I'm used to this. Don't worry about it. And you go and you just say, you know, whatever it is, Mr. President, uh, I don't know. We started the three mile island nuclear power plant again and it blew up. Damn it. I don't know why we did that. It was very foolish. And uh, China Syndrome, you remember that? That was from the, your glory days. You remember that movie? Oh, yeah, totally, yes. No. Um, I didn't see that one. Uh, uh, whatever. It's boring a hole through the earth. Uh, we're all going to die. Uh, not sure what to do about that. Let me tell you something. Though. If we, I got You wanted me to be upset. I'll give you upset. If we all die, if this earth, planet earth, comes to an end, doomsday arrives... And we have not sealed the border. I am going to die so frustrated. Let me tell you that all he does, he just comes to the meeting and he says, I don't care what's going on. It doesn't matter. It doesn't interest me. I know my talking points. So it's like going to a rally for him, his, his, his cabinet meetings. So angry about immigration. Does anybody have any good news that's easily understandable very quickly to report? And then I'll say, that's fantastic. We're doing a great job on the thing that, the guy with the glasses said, whatever his name is, uh, and, and that's basically it. That, that's where we are. That's the level uh, that we're working on here is he's a president who has literally no idea what's happening in his cabinet. And it doesn't matter to him. He's unafraid to go to cabinet meetings because he can always just do the greatest hits and treat it like a rally and yell at the people who which one of you is in charge of immigration um well that'd be me sir well you're doing a horrible job because there's still immigrants that's that's actually the the washington uh, or the white house position on these things well sir you know we operate in the real world and uh, people cross the border all the time for instance carrying wonderful cheap uh consumer goods to us or coming across the border to pick vegetables so that we can all go to supermarkets and get vegetables very easily uh, on the nice, well-lit shelves. I know, but I don't like uh, Mexico or Mexicans, so isn't there something that could be done about it? Well, you know, in reality, no, there isn't. They have to cross the border in order to pick the vegetables and run the farms. Well... I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I think this is the calm Donald Trump who's been satisfied in some way. I'm going to say, if he was talking the truth with his cabinet, I'm going to say you're horrible. And I'm also going to say that I'm fantastic and that I am making great progress in sealing the borders, but that you suck because you're doing a horrible job at sealing the borders. Now, even though they're supposed to work together and it can't be the case that they're both doing a horrible job and a fantastic job, that won't matter to Donald Trump. I'm doing a fantastic job on the border stuff, whatever it is. They're doing a terrible job on the border stuff, whatever it is. And if you really want an answer about how that could be, I'm doing a great job telling you how bad they are doing. And that is not at all beyond him he's absolutely going to do that uh i've spent far too much time on this one it's time to move on to the other things we have in pocket and try and keep it brief i guess so that we can get more news to you for the weekend sam stein tweeting uh the quite true and excellent observation on a tweet by craig gilbert who is a political reporter at the washington bureau of milwaukee journal sentinel 
and in fact, I'm sorry, the Washington bureau chief for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, observing on a party line vote, Senate Republicans fill the oldest appellate vacancy in the U.S., the Wisconsin seat on the Seventh Circuit. They did so by ending the blue slip veto for home state senators, a power that made it possible for Republicans to block Obama's nominee for the very same seat. Yes, uh, in case you were wondering uh, what any of that meant, if you're not familiar with the blue slip veto, uh, Wisconsin, uh, well, like every every state, basically, uh, each state's senator, uh, we've explained it before, have the blue slip that they are supposed to return to acknowledge their assent to the nomination of someone uh, from their state sitting in a federal court in their state. And uh, it used to be the case back in the olden days that both senators had to return those blue slips. Now, you might think of that. I'm sure that strikes people as ridiculous now if they've been brought up only in this political era. Why, they might ask, would you even expect a Republican from some state to return a blue slip on a judge nominated by a Democrat in that state? Wouldn't they just use the blue slip to block everything? Ordinarily, back in the olden days, the answer was no, because people said, look, the president's entitled to his nominees. That's something that old John McCain used to say back in the day until he stopped saying it, which is maybe one of the reasons that people aren't necessarily all that sad to see the natural course of things progress, as we might say, uh, with John McCain and everybody else, for that matter. Uh, it's just a thing that used to happen. I recognize, though I'm a Republican senator, I understand and acknowledge that the people of the United States might elect a Democrat to office. But they didn't understand that, not during the Obama administration. And so the blue slip thing came into play at that point. Republicans would simply refuse to return their blue slips for any Obama nominee. And the uh, Democrats at the time, when last they controlled the Senate Judiciary Committee, said, well, we're not going to do away with this tradition because it's unfair and we certainly want to be able to use the same power when we're the out party. And so they preserved the blue slip rule. And ha, lo and behold, when they were the out party, guess what? That rule wasn't there for them anymore. They simply got rid of it. Uh, now, if you were thinking for any reason of making the excuse, well, you know, maybe we couldn't have predicted that Republicans would go so far as to eliminate the blue slip rule. The answer is no, uh, that doesn't work. That's not a functional excuse because we've seen the Republicans do exactly this thing before. The rule was always you had to have the blue slips back from both senators from the state. But when George W. Bush was nominating judges and Orrin Hatch was chair of the Judiciary Committee, and he could only get one blue slip back from a Republican senator from that state, and the Democratic senator of that state refused to hand over the blue slip, Orrin Hatch said, well, you know, maybe the rule ought to be that at least one blue slip has to be returned, if not both. And that infuriated Senate Democrats. It infuriated uh, Pat Leahy, who was the who had previously been the Democratic chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and he said, "I never did that, but the Republicans are doing that, and it's outrageous." And then he got the chair back later on, and Pat Leahy said, "Well, to prove my virtue in this, I mean, it's a very nice thing to do. I love proving virtue." He said, we're going to restore the old rule. You got to have the two blue slips. Everyone had seen Orrin Hatch say, meh, blue slip, schmoo slip. I don't know how you would, I, I can't pull that pronunciation off for some reason. We'll just do the one. And Pat Leahy said, we're going back. We're going to handicap ourselves. We're willing to handicap ourselves. I know that it could be bad for us 
since we're now back in the majority and we have a Democratic president and we want to fill those seats. I know it could be bad, but I'm willing to take that risk because I fully believe that should be the rule for everyone. And the Republicans said, fine, schmuck. When we get back into power, you know we're going to go back to the other rule because screw you. I don't give a goddamn about your principles. Congratulations. You've proven your principles. Big effing deal. I can't wait to destroy your principles. Lo and behold, things happened. A Republican was elected president for one thing. Republicans took control of the Senate for another. The Senate Judiciary Committee once again chaired by a Republican. And poof, there go there it goes. Pat Leahy's virtue up in smoke. Boy, this is terrible and it's an outrage and a disgrace. Yep, but it's happening. And not only the, did they go to the one rule, they, they, they actually said, well, what if, what if Donald Trump nominates a, a judge in a state that has two, count them, two Democratic senators and neither one of them will return a blue slip? Then even the Orrin Hatch rule is useless to us. Now we have the Chuck Grassley rule. You know what? What's a blue slip? I never heard of such a thing. Now you don't have to have any of them. Why? Because that's what I said. But Pat Leahy, wow, outrageous. Uh, I'm so mad. Uh-huh. Yeah, I knew you would be. But in the meantime, you can't even turn around and screw us back later because one, you're too virtuous. Two, you're probably too old and you aren't going to get the gavel back. And three, who cares? There's no vacancy in that seat anymore anyway because we filled it. That's it. So there you have it. And Sam Stein observing upon Greg, Craig Gilbert's observation. Not only did all of this happen, not only did they get rid of the blue slip thing in order to fill that seat, but the guy who was just confirmed to that seat without having a blue slip applauded the use of the blue slip to keep that seat vacant during the Obama years. So how do you like that? Yeah, when when Ron Johnson was around and able, and he still is, and able to use his blue slip to make sure that Obama couldn't fill that seat because a Republican a senator was refusing to return the blue slip on a judge Obama had nominated to that seat, which would have rendered the vacancy closed. The guy who's in that seat now said, good, that's an excellent rule. It's awesome. You really do have to get both blue slips back in order to make this thing work and then was nominated. And then the blue slips weren't coming back because Wisconsin had a Democrat in the Senate. And all of a sudden, not only did the rules suck, but that stupid rule that that dumbass said was a good rule. Oh, that dumbass was me. Well, uh, can I have the seat anyway? Yes, you can. There you go. So that's the news. And uh, I guess probably ought to look over at uh, Craig Gilbert's story on that one, so I can tell you who it is. It is Milwaukee lawyer Michael Brennan confirmed for the U.S. Court of Appeals. Uh, this in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, of course, because he's the chief for, of the bureau for them. Milwaukee lawyer Michael Brennan confirmed for a key federal judgeship Thursday, filling the oldest appellate vacancy in the country, but deepening a partisan schism. That's what it is. Those stupid partisans and their schisms in the U.S. Senate over judges. Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in Chicago. The seat has stood open since 2010 amid a, quote, bitter political standoff. Both sides. He was confirmed, by the way, 49-46 with only Republican votes over the objections of Democrat Tammy Baldwin, Wisconsin's junior senator and the holder of that other blue slip, which sucks and doesn't count anymore except when it is keeping the seat open for Michael Brennan, then Michael Brennan is a huge fan of it. And now that it's time to give him the seat, uh, blue slips suck again. Well done. Let's see. Other news that you'll need for the weekend. Rudy Giuliani on the outs, and in fact completely out, I guess, from his law firm, uh, which is not surprising because he's a terrible lawyer and they didn't want anything to do with him anymore. Uh, Auto playing video. Thank you, New York Times. Giuliani's law firm undercuts his statements as they part ways. Michael Schmidt and Maggie Haberman, everyone's favorites, getting together for this one. President Trump's personal lawyer, Rudolph W. Giuliani. God love you, New York Times. I, I think if you just relaxed your your formality a little bit, people might even like you better. 
Anyway, he abruptly resigned from his law firm, which then promptly undercut his recent statements defending the president. Giuliani had had taken a leave of absence last month from the firm Greenberg Traurig to represent Mr. Trump. But the firm, one of the nation's largest, said in a statement on Thursday that he no longer worked there. (laughs) Firm partners had chafed over Giuliani's public comments about payments that another of Mr. Trump's lawyers, sort of, Michael Cohen, made to secure the silence of a pornographic film actress, you know which one, who said she had an affair with Mr. Trump. The president has denied her allegations, but not really. I totally nailed her, but I didn't. Giuliani suggested that such payments were common at his firm, which is going to make the firm say, what? And in fact, they did, even without the knowledge of the clients. That was money, quote, that was money that was paid by his lawyer, the way I would do out of his law firm funds, he said on Fox News, thereby guaranteeing his firing from his law firm, right? He added, Michael would take care of things like this that I take care of with my clients. And Greenberg Traurig had a heart attack and said, get the F out of our firm. The New York Times asked Greenberg Traurig about those remarks early this week. Shortly after Giuliani's resignation was announced, the firm responded, we cannot speak for Mr. Giuliani with respect to what was intended by his remarks. Speaking for ourselves, we would not condone payments of the nature alleged to have been made or otherwise without the knowledge and direction of a client. That according to spokeswoman for the firm, Jill Perry, Mr. Trump has publicly denied knowing about the payments as they were made. Mr. Giuliani said the president reimbursed Mr. Cohen for them, an arrangement he said was routine. Giuliani had to walk back many of his comments, and he laughed when he read the statement from the firm. First of all, I don't think they really understand what I said. He said, he said, this is some writing here. That's actually what it reads verbatim. First of all, I don't think they really understand what I said. He said, he said he was referring to a non-disclosure agreement that Mr. Cohen had negotiated. That is a very common part of a settlement. In fact, any lawyer would negotiate that for a client. That's not what you said, but okay. You get the idea. Uh, There is more detail here. And again, once again, I encourage you to consume all written materials uh, possible and available to you. But that's uh, what you need to know for the weekend. Giuliani said, this is totally common. I used to do it myself. And his firm said, okay, then you're fired. And that's that. P.S. You should probably also be disbarred, but we'll get to that. Uh, Let's see. Uh, This also a very interesting uh, storyline here. Uh, I believe I picked it up from this tweet here. Sarah Fryer. Sarah Fryer. I have to look and figure out exactly who I'm talking about here. Tech reporter for Bloomberg in SF, San Francisco. Okay. Uh, This an interesting series of tweets and connected to an interesting article, the tweet that caught my eye. Uh, The ads Russia ran on Facebook during and after Trump's election are now public and viewable here. And uh, it's a compilation, I guess, put together by the Democrats on the House Intelligence Committee. She adds, I've looked through many of them, and it's clear that Russia was aiming to exploit the fault lines in American society gun control, race relations, immigration, and get people angry on both sides. Both sides, yay. Paying to promote rallies both pro and anti-Trump. This is not a new angle on the story, but it is a good reminder. And, uh, uh, you know, of, of A, what they were doing, and B, why the fact that they might have been trying to anger people on both sides or that they paid for both pro and anti-Trump uh, rallies and political ads doesn't let them off the hook. I, th- that would be the most amazing thing about this whole episode. If our fetishism about both sides led us to conclude that there was nothing nefarious about the Russians advertising because they advertised to both sides. It's a, a, there will be people who point at that too. Both sides. So therefore, okay. I hope, I hope that Sarah Fryer isn't among them doesn't really feel like that. Anna Edgerton joined her on the byline on this piece for Bloomberg. Lawmakers released a trove of more than 3,500 Russian-backed Facebook ads. Hmm. Uh, A trove of thousands of Russian-backed Facebook ads being made public for the first time show that Russia's main goal was provoking discontent in the U.S., leading to and continuing beyond Donald Trump's election in 2016. 
The ads, which are one of the clearest demonstrations of Russia's financial investment in disrupting American politics, and what an investment it was, Facebook ads are dirt cheap, have been much discussed by Congress, Facebook, and Special Counsel Robert Mueller behind closed doors. For some lawmakers, they raised questions about whether Russia was successful in swaying public opinion in Trump's favor or otherwise. For Facebook, the ads deepened the reckoning over the company's responsibility in society, big question, and especially in elections. The 3,519 ads released Thursday by Dems on the House Intelligence Committee were posted between 2015 and 2017. They were designed to draw clicks from people who had liked Facebook groups on both sides of emotional issues involving gun regulations, Muslims, that's an issue, Muslims, the existence of Muslims, gay rights, again, similar problem, immigration, African Americans, who also exist, and various candidates. Representative Adam Schiff of California, the intelligence panel's ranking Democrat, said Facebook cooperated with the committee to make those ads public to help prevent similar abuse in the future. The only way we can begin to inoculate ourselves against the future attack is to see firsthand the types of messages, themes, and imagery that Russians use to divide us, Schiff said in a statement. I think I agree with that. The pile of social media evidence was released as some states have already held primaries for this year's midterm elections amid warnings that electoral systems haven't been sufficiently safeguarded. Dems on the increasingly partisan House Intelligence Committee, increasingly partisan, took the lead on redacting and publishing the full trove of ads, although they were shared with GOP members. Lawmakers released some sample ads during a series of hearings last year. A report from the panel's Republicans also declared they found no evidence of collusion between Russia and the Trump campaign. The files published Thursday show the text of each ad, number of impressions, and number of clicks. Some of the posts were targeted to users in certain cities or those who liked or befriended specific groups. In some cases, the posts urged people to participate in actual rallies, drawing hundreds or even thousands of people to say they were interested or planning on going. A series of posts targeted to people who liked the Russia-linked group called Black Matters were only shown to users in cities that had had episodes of racial unrest, including Ferguson, Missouri, Baltimore, and Cleveland. Different ads sought to stir up opposing sides of the same event or issue. For example, one ad from July of 2017 said the gunman who killed five police officers in Dallas in 2016 used buildings owned by Muslims to carry out the attack. That was from the Heart of Texas, that extraordinarily stupid Facebook group, Heart of Texas. Yeah, that's some kind of, you know, who cares, right? Why not? We'll just lie. That's one of the more egregious examples. Muslims need uh, seem not to be as peace-loving as they say, the text says. I don't want to see 10,000 potential terrorists here in Texas. Sure. That ad was aimed at people who identified themselves as patriotic. That's problematic. And aimed to get likes for the Russia-run page, Heart of Texas, which organized anti-Muslim activism. It was shared 675 times. Ads on another page around the same time encouraged Muslims to let everyone know that they didn't support terrorism. Really? Uh, one of those ads from the Russian page United Muslims of America got 576 shares. The Heart of Texas group also posted about veterans and border security, often using doctored images designed to stir an emotional response. One post claims that the Democratic candidate Hillary Clinton, you remember her, had a 69% disapproval rating among veterans. Another ad from this group called on people to, quote, honor your ancestors by participating in a secession rally. That would probably be a bad way of honoring your ancestors, but more than 800 people reacted. The accounts that brought the ads, bought the ads were linked to the Internet Research Agency, you know them, a Kremlin-backed group that has been indicted by Mueller for its activities. Most of the ads were purchased in rubles, which is a pretty good hint, right? One post from October 2016 depicting Clinton with a clown nose promises that by liking the Clinton fraudation page, you'll learn, quote, everything you wanted to know about Clinton's dark side. The Internet Research Agency paid 3,611 rubles, which at the time was worth about $58, to target people interested in Trump's candidacy. And 3,730 people, that is 3,730 people, saw it. Since releasing the ads, Facebook has been trying to prevent similar foreign manipulation in other elections around the world. 
as well as in this year's U.S. congressional elections. The company says it's been on the lookout for threats and working to make election ads more transparent by designing them as designating them as political. For example, Facebook is also working to verify the identities of advertisers in the U.S. who want to run ads on political issues. And I guess, you know, what other steps might you even take? I guess that's really all that's available to them at this point. Still, the company says more needs to be done. Uh-oh, don't tell Donald Trump that. He'll complain at a, at a cabinet meeting. And it can't guarantee it can ever fix the problem. That's true, too. Facebook has been hiring more people to work on election security, indicating that they think it will be a long-term issue, like spam and hacking, that requires constant vigilance probably right about that and that may be the only thing about which they're right other than the inability to stop it ultimately hi everybody it's me david let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show if you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device why not sit down and record a segment for us read us an important article and give us your take read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the k in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Last segment before we uh, take off for the weekend, because it's Friday. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the Bloomberg piece wraps up with a section on post-election meddling, just in case you weren't sure that the job over at Facebook would require constant vigilance. Even after Trump was elected, the Russians continued to use social media to stir unrest. The page being patriotic. And again, uh, their stilted English really should be a tip. I mean, I guess all by itself, being patriotic doesn't strike you as stilted English, but as a page name, you know. But is it stilted English? Is it just dumb person's English? Sometimes it's difficult to tell when it's just two words. The page Being Patriotic paid 1,999 rubles for an ad on November 10th that prompt, uh, promoted a Trump rally. Now, I'm going to tell you how they promoted the Trump rally, but then I got to circle back on something for you. Today, some massive crowds of libtards marched in NYC against election of Donald Trump. Against election of Donald Trump. I mean, you can practically hear it in the writing. The ad said people should gather at Trump Tower the Saturday after the election. Quote, show Mr. Trump there actually are people in NY who voted for him. And that sounded like American English, sort of, kind of, except uh, here's the issue. Like, uh, I mean, they didn't have people at Facebook on the case yet. I mean, this is post-election, but it's November 10th. It's immediately following the election. We haven't quite as a country woken up to what's going on here. So they, they wouldn't have anybody there to see this. But I mean, I guess if they had some sort of human monitor to all this, uh, please tell me that this would strike you. The page being patriotic is paying in rubles. How is this happening? And nobody's not being patriotic. I, it's, I mean, you could be a patriotic Russian, certainly, but then the flags in the uh, in the the avatar that they use here for the being patriotic page wouldn't be two crossed American flags. And look at this. I'm going to take a quick look at this. Is it still active, or did they close that page down? I don't know. I gotta I gotta find out whether they have maybe maybe Google Images will have something being patriotic Facebook. I want to take a look at the icon that they have there because it looks like, I mean, it's two, I can see it's two crossed American flags. Oh, okay. And it's like a golden star in between them. I couldn't make out what was in that picture. Although I guess if you really take a good close look at the star, it certainly is awfully uh, like Russian futurist style. Like they just colored it gold instead of red, I guess. But I, I'm amazed that nobody picks up on, the fact that being patriotic is paying for their ads in rubles. But it's all automated, so that's why. 
So they go on to uh, cry that uh, libtards are going to march in America and we got to do something about it. And uh, the ad targeted people employed by the New York Police Department, interestingly enough, or the U.S. Army Reserves, or who were members of the National Rifle Association. At the time, the event had 248 people interested in attending and 60 people RSVP'd. Doesn't mean anything, but there it is. Around the same time, through different channels, Russia promoted rallies against the president-elect, the BM, Black Matters, page, which again, bad English, not, doesn't say Black Lives Matter, it's Black Matters, which provided Facebook distribution for the website blackmattersus.com, advertised the list of anti-Trump meetups using the Not My President hashtag. One of those ads, which cost 1,378 rubles, was targeted toward people who said they liked Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. I mean, it's amazing that you can collect information about that at all. Like, do you like Malcolm X? Do you like Martin Luther King Jr.? I clicked like. Where are we? Anyway, more than 10,000 people saw that and 1,310 of them clicked. This kind of interference has led some lawmakers to call for greater regulation of tech companies. Uh, You know the story there. And I think we will end our... Uh, coverage of of that particular story here, and let's uh, take a last look back in uh, in in pocket, and then quickly back at the Twitter feed that I've been seeing for the last couple of days, because I know there's some things in there that didn't make it to pocket that I wanted to share with you. Here's an interesting story that I how did I come across it? I'm sure it was Twitter that pointed me back to it. It's an old story, old from March. Like, who even remembers March? Uh, But because Elliot Broidy has been in the news and we've been talking a lot about him, I I don't know. I don't know who tweeted it. I stumbled across it. Something that uh, counts as old because it's from March. It's in the Huff Post. And I think we missed it at the time, but it's worth bringing up again because it it's a headline that you would think would crop up right now. Leaked emails. (laughs) <laughs> appear to show a top Trump fundraiser abusing his power. Now, if this appeared today and then everybody saw the subheader that said the messages suggest that Elliot Broidy tried to use his influence with the Trump administration for personal gain, you would say, oh, well, yes, I absolutely suspected that that's what he was doing. I thought this was the story that would result from it. But then you realize this was a story that broke before the admission from or the fake admission i guess from michael cohen in the uh in in the hearings about the raids on his houses that that Brody was supposedly a client and of course before the very good and seemingly still solid speculation that Brody was in fact not having an affair with whatever her name is the playboy playmate was it shara Breshard or something quite like that, and that that was in fact just cover for Donald Trump having been the person having the affair with her. Uh, but this probably then deserves another look. It certainly would get more eyeballs now than it did then, I would guess. Uh, what are we talking about? Well, uh, Maxwell, Max Strachan, I guess, and Jessica Schulberg are the reporters on this one. Uh, And I guess, yeah, it's uh, directly for HuffPost. They did this piece here. Uh, Emails and documents. An anonymous group leaked to HuffPost this week. Uh Uh-oh. Appeared to show a Los Angeles lawyer, just a Los Angeles lawyer, asking for more than $80 million. Why? To scuttle a Department of Justice investigation into a multi-billion dollar scandal involving Van Gogh paintings, the movie The Wolf of Wall Street, ironically enough, the prime minister of Malaysia and the lawyer's husband. It wasn't even him. Elliot, is Elliot Broidy a lawyer? I don't know. Anyway, the lawyer is his wife. But Broidy uh, is a Republican National Committee deputy finance chair. That's who they're talking about. Elliot Broidy. Uh, he res- resigned since, though, trying to use his influence with the Trump administration to help. Broidy and his wife, attorney Robin Rosenzweig, deny any wrongdoing. Can you believe that? Now, this is interesting. It's definitely a hack, Rosenzweig said of the emails. I guess that means that the emails were 
stolen, but it, I, I'm not certain for sure whether she's saying, well, my emails were hacked and that's how they got them and that's bad. And so, you know, how sometimes people say, therefore, you shouldn't pay any attention to it because they should have been private the whole time. <clears throat> unless they belong to Hillary Clinton or someone associated with her, in which case, look, I understand privacy, but you can't just cover up evidence of a crime. Whatever. It's definitely a hack, Rosenzweig said of the emails, which were first reported by the Wall Street Journal. They've hacked attorney-client privileged documents. How ironic that that should come up in, in early March uh, and then, of course, be declared dead later because... Uh, uh, the criminal Michael Cohen either didn't actually have such a privilege or they were evidence of an ongoing conspiracy to commit crimes and so therefore weren't privileged, but whatever. Uh, and of course, uh, they've hacked attorney-client privileged documents, but that just means that they, if they really were and truly were privileged, then you would have an issue with admitting them into evidence in court. That doesn't mean that we all have to forget they existed and never point to them. Broidy's assistant also said that Mr. Broidy has been a victim of a hack. HuffPost has not been able to identify the people who leaked the documents, who call themselves L.A. Confidential. We expose people associated with Hollywood, the group said in an email. It's not clear what the group's motivations are. And I don't know who they are either, but uh, we'll later probably find out, oh, my God, they're uh, Russian, too, because, I mean, what kind of – that's your mission? We expose people associated with Hollywood? Why? After HuffPost re provided Rosenzweig with the leaked emails and documents, she said she didn't recognize some of them, although she did not identify which ones looked unfamiliar. Rosenzweig, who also goes by Robin Broidy – and her husband are conducting a personal investigation, she said. So when they find OJ's, uh, the real killer in the OJ case, they'll let us know. And uh, that's the part that confused me. Is she saying that somebody forged the emails? And is that what she means by a hack or what? I'm still not sure. The dossier, as the leakers called it, hmm, demonstrates Broidy's clear and continued fascination with a topic of great financial interest to his wife, and one of her prospective clients. The story starts in July 2016, when the Justice Department filed civil forfeiture complaints seeking to recover more than $1 billion in assets allegedly acquired with funds misappropriated from One Malaysia Development Berhad, B-E-R-H-A-D. I don't know what that's supposed to mean, but it's abbreviated for short as One, the number One, One MDB. That is a state-owned development company established by Malaysian Prime Minister Najib Razak. The Justice Department's complaint stated that Lo Taik Jo, that's my best attempt at the pronunciation of the name, L-O-W, Lo Taik, T-A-E-K, Jo, J-H-O. And mind you, of course, that's just our anglicization of what the whatever the actual alphabet would be to use to spell that out in, in uh, the native language. Lo Take Joe, a Malaysian businessman, had laundered in the U.S. more than $400 million stolen from 1MDB. The 1MDB funds was alleged, uh, allegedly used, uh, were allegedly used, I guess, but the fund, uh, whatever. The money was allegedly used to buy, you'll never guess, how would you launder money in the United States? Did you say real estate? Good guess. But also some other stuff, not Persian rugs, but other artwork of indeterminate value that nobody can put a finger on the actual dollar amount. It's just one of those things that's sort of kind of whatever you want to pay for it. Van Gogh and Monet paintings and a private jet which isn't so far off the mark for uh, valuation question marks and to finance the movie. The Wolf of Wall Street. How do you like that? How ironic is it that you would steal funds from a uh, a, a foreign government's uh, what? What are they? How do they call it? State-owned development company, and launder it in various ways in the United States, and then use it to finance the Wolf of Wall Street. Well, seems perfect. Malaysian investigations into one MDB found. Guess what? No wrongdoing on the part of the company or Najib, the prime minister. 
according to the Wall Street Journal. Najib, Lowe, and 1MDB have denied any wrongdoing. Lowe also. Hmm. And 1MDB says it will cooperate with any investigations into its business. But the Justice Department was still pursuing Lowe and needed help. And now embedded in here is one of these allegedly hacked emails from Robin Broidy uh, to It Is Unknown. Subject, draft litigation retainer agreement for low take Joe and relevant companies and draft consulting agreement for you. Uh, and the names are redacted here. Dear redacted person. Hope you're well. Nice to be working with you again. Again? Really? Attached. Please find the following documents for your review. Retainer and fee agreement. Litigation services between Colfax Law Office Incorporated and Low Take Joe. And a consulting agreement between the same. Uh, or actually it says between Colfax Law Incorporated and Redacted. So consulting agreement with somebody else. Since Low Take Joe is named in here. And this one's redacted. Please feel free to call me or Elliot with any comments or concerns you have. All the best, Robin, and then some redaction. I think the telephone number. It's not entirely clear how Lowe and Rosenzweig first got in touch. Maybe it was uh, the lawyer that all of Donald Trump's various conquests were referred to. Maybe it was Michael Cohen. Maybe, I don't know. Nobody really knows. On March 12th, 2017, shortly before President Donald Trump took office, Rosenzweig wrote up a draft agreement in which she would agree to work for Lowe. I uh, just read it to you, or at least the email that is referenced. In the draft agreement, Rosenzweig proposed that Lowe would pay her and her firm, the Colfax Law Office, don't know what that is, $8 million up front. Wow. The deal would also give her and the firm an incentive to work fast. Lowe would pay an additional $50 million if the firm succeeded in, quote, settling the matter, the DOJ investigation, within a year. That figure jumped to $75 million if the firm succeeded within 180 days. And the relevant uh, contract is quoted and uh, pictured here. Rosenzweig later adjusted the draft agreement to provide for a flat fee after learning that success fees and a non-refundable retainer fee are not legal in New York. She wrote to her husband and a consultant working on the case. Now, they're working in California, but whatever. Okay. Emails given to HuffPost do not indicate whether Rosenzweig's firm ever finalized an agreement to provide services to Lowe. This was just a draft agreement. Although Broidy pleaded guilty in 2009 to giving New York public pension officials nearly $1 million worth of illegal gifts to help his venture capital firm make a deal with the pension fund. That was the OSC case that we were talking about yesterday. Remember when I told you I was reading the allocution that Broidy made in which he confessed, this is how we got to it, I think. This must be it. How he confessed to paying off a government official's girlfriend to keep her quiet as part of a bribery deal. Well, this is who they were talking about. It was a pension fund um, uh, official in New York that he was bribing and paying off that guy's girlfriend, allegedly. Uh, although, he, not allegedly, he allocated to it. So, there we are. Pardon me. Uh, poor, uh, uh, although Broidy pleaded guilty in 2009, and it's linked to a New York Times story uh, about the case, to giving New York public pension officials nearly a million dollars worth of illegal gifts in exchange for helping his venture capital firm get money from the pension fund, it's easy to see how Lowe could have benefited from working with the couple. Broidy has close ties to Trump in the Republican Party, and he's in fact covering up one of his affairs, apparently. During the 2016 presidential race, he served as vice chairman for the Trump Victory Fund. He gave more than $160,000 to the RNC last year. One month after Rosenzweig wrote the draft agreement with Lowe, the RNC announced that Broidy had been named National Deputy Finance Chair, along with Michael Cohen, and here's a name we haven't heard yet, Louis DeJoy. Hmm. In May, Rosenzweig indicated that her law firm would need to enter into a contract with Pross Michael. Is it Michael or Michelle? A friend of Lowe's and a member of hip-hop group The Fugees, which suggests that I should know better how to pronounce this person's name but I ain't that cool. According to the emails, Lowe wanted to pay Rosenzweig through Michelle or Michael or however that name is pronounced. Michelle and his publicist 
did not immediately respond to a request for comment. That, I hope they have responded since early March, but probably not. They probably never thought this was going to come back up again. How do you like that? Lowe wants to pay Rosenzweig through a member of the Fugees for this work. Odd. Maybe that's the person whose name is redacted in all this, but then that would seem like a useless redaction if they have this information. After Rosenzweig started working on an agreement with Lowe, her husband, Elliot, began circulating talking points that described efforts to convince the Justice Department to halt the Malaysia investigation. In August of 2017, Broidy sent an assistant at his investment firm an email titled Malaysia Talking Points Final. The email does not note who wrote the talking points or who was expected to deliver them, but they appear to be drafted from the perspective of a Malaysian official in preparation for a meeting with a U.S. official. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, he's no longer Secretary of State, visited Malaysia two days later as a part of a Southeast Asia tour, and Trump hosted Najib, the Malaysian prime minister, swept up in the 1MDB scandal at the White House in September. Just interesting to note. The talking points, the email containing them, is uh, included here in the article in screenshot form. The talking points email laid out four priorities, the first three being North Korea, counterterrorism cooperation, and the economy. The fourth, however, was 1MDB, and it included five main points with their emphasis and uh, misspellings included, by the way. One, uh, one MDB message on all levels. This is being handles by Saudi Arabia and Abu Dhabi and Malaysia. What in the world that means? I don't know, but I'm afraid to find out. Uh, Malay, number two, Malaysian Attorney General has publicly announced that no American has been harmed by any 1MDB transaction. So I guess that's probably not true either. Three, the involvement of U.S. prosecutors in 1MDB has caused unnecessary tension. This is what it says, unnecessary tension American. Really. And could cause a negative reaction among Malaysians. Look out. Four, Malaysian Attorney General have publicly announced no harm has been caused to any investors. Five, finally, I will send Malaysian Attorney General ahead of my visit to the U.S. in September to meet President Trump. I would like an introduction to Attorney General Sessions. Weird bunch of stuff. The person who drafted the talking points also wrote, quote, Secretary Tillerson may mention Elliot Broidy's name. If he does, I will confirm that I know Elliot and that he wants a closer relationship between the USA and Malaysia which is automatically taken to be a good thing. At the time, the Justice Department was escalating its efforts to go after Lowe and the Development Fund. Prosecutors asked the federal courts to stay the department's civil lawsuits and announced a criminal probe into 1MDB in August. Months later, Broidy was still focused on the matter and appeared to be upping the pressure. On January 5th, 2018, Broidy sent himself an email titled Rick Gates Talking Points, which is a great way to have that stuff surveilled, a possible reference to a former Trump campaign aide who pleaded guilty last month in an unrelated conspiracy case, or some other Rick Gates, I'm sure. That's why we say possible reference. The email includes an explicit description of an effort to persuade the Justice Department and the White House to reverse course on the Malaysia graft case, uh, and those talking points here. We are working with the DOJ to counter the previous administration's case against 1MDB MDB in Malaysia. I have put a strategy in place to contact parties both at DOJ and the National Security Council to find a resolution to this issue. Two, I am in the process of scheduling a meeting with the Assistant Attorney General who has the oversight for the Malaysia case. She is a Trump appointee and can be helpful. Brody may be referencing Rachel Brand who was the associate attorney general at the time, not an assistant attorney general. As I informed you earlier in my discussions with the president, he committed to getting this issue resolved. Of course, why not? Just commit to anything. It is important that I take his lead, but will continue to communicate the importance of the issue. The president very much wants to see you reelected and wants this issue to be resolved. He has reiterated that to me. He has no idea, I'm sure. It is also helpful to know that a new attorney will be confirmed shortly. That's what it says. New attorney. 
confirmed shortly that we'll have some jurisdiction over the matter and was formerly the number two general counsel at Boeing. This presumably a reference to John Demers, then the nominee to head the Justice Department's National Security Division. It will be easy to brief him on the matter and get his involvement. Six, I am working on this issue from several angles, and we will work to get this done as quickly as possible. Those points were similar to five laid out in another document created by an unknown author and shared with HuffPost. I am in the process of scheduling a meeting with Associate Attorney General Rachel Brand, who has the oversight for the Malaysia case. The document reads in part, she is a Trump appointee and viewed as the only true Trump appointee currently at DOJ. (laughs) The Attorney General doesn't count, I guess. Brand resigned from her position last month, remember this is back in March, and could not be reached for comment. In addition, the National Security Division of DOJ is involved, and President Trump has appointed John Damers, formerly of Boeing, to that position. The document continues, referring to the man who became Assistant Attorney General for the National Security Division last month. He is awaiting his confirmation, but will be confirmed shortly. I will also meet with John. He will be an instrumental figure in the resolution of the Malaysia issues. A representative for Broidy and Rosenzweig told HuffPost that neither of them wrote the text in the emails describing interactions with Trump and Justice Department officials. Chris Clark, the couple's lawyer, told the Wall Street Journal that the couple did not discuss Lowe's case with Trump, his staff, or anyone at the Justice Department. They just got $8 million for nothing. The Justice Department declined to comment and the White House did not respond to a request for comment. The investigation into 1MDB and Lowe continues just this week, and again, that's back in March. At the request of U.S. authorities, Indonesian police seized a luxury yacht in Bali tied to the scandal. Lowe's location is currently unknown, according to Reuters. His company in Hong Kong did not respond to a request for comment. Very interesting. Uh, Oh, a correction apparently noted at the bottom here. A previous version of the story indicated Brody was a convicted felon. While he pleaded guilty to a felony in 2009, he was convicted of a misdemeanor as part of a plea deal. Just so you know. So that's not likely to get boosted back up into the news anytime soon, unless, of course, we start talking about it. Maybe we can boost its profile. But I thought an important piece of information to take with you into the weekend about Elliot Broidy, who is only uh, surely going to look more guilty of more things in the days to come. Okay, well, that's about all the time that we've got for today. No use in introducing any new or interesting stories at this point. Uh, Just noting Uh, Some things that I saw in passing uh, via Twitter that uh, look like they ought to be awfully interesting developments. We'll see whether anything comes of it. For instance, The Hill's reporting that Don Blankenship apparently is plotting to ruin his former Republican rival's candidacy uh, and his chance of winning the race, I guess because he's bitter that he lost. And, uh, well... Gee whiz, I did have uh, somebody suggest to me that perhaps this is the reason why uh, people like uh, Joe Manchin, who also running for Senate in <laughs> in uh, in West Virginia, might be reluctant to go over the top and criticizing Blankenship because he would be a target for retaliation. Of course, that's a part of the job description and B to be expected. It is more expected. I would guess that former rivals for the Republican nomination for Senate in West Virginia would be interested in attacking uh, the democratic nominee than the Republican nominee, in fact. But uh, I don't know. I, I, I guess he thinks that by being nice, that won't happen. And maybe he has a better understanding of Blankenship, or maybe they actually have an understanding as between themselves that Blankenship was, going to do something like this or likely to do something like this. And I don't know. I mean, Manchin's the former governor of the state. He surely knows Blankenship and how he operates and maybe even knows him personally. But the more surprising, I guess, angle here is that uh, Blankenship wants to, quote, make sure Morrissey doesn't win Senate bid. And I do, too. So why not? We'll uh, look into that. I don't have time to share the story with you at this point other than to point you to it. And uh, I think you'll find it interesting reading, no doubt, for the weekend. And we'll see where we are after this next crazy weekend. It's great weather here in Virginia for the weekend. So I expect that uh, Dodor J. Trump will make the best of it by proving that he's too busy to sit down for an interview with Robert Mueller 
and uh, heading out our way for a couple thousand rounds of golf, during which I'm sure he'll shoot 18s every single time, and you're going to Guantanamo if you think it doesn't happen. Okay, well, at any rate, time to uh, wrap things up and uh, send you off to Justice Putnam's West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy to pick up on the other stories that we might have missed. Let's scan the skies and see what he's got on tap for you. There's a real danger, he says, in Democrats caving to Republican bullies and abandoning Nancy Pelosi. Wouldn't that be a huge victory for them? And then on the rest of the menu, a Michigan town is sued for barring non-Christians from living within its limits. That that would result in a lawsuit, wouldn't it? Interior Secretary Zinke busted lying at a Senate Appropriations Committee hearing about his political favorite of Florida. And Paul Ryan says he's been for term limits since the day he got to Congress 19 years ago. What else has he got? Here we go. Trump's Treaty of Versailles precedent is a reminder that the last time America withdrew from its own international security agreements, from uh, Daily it didn't Radio, go so well. On NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the k in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Yes, of course, a reference to pulling out of the Iran deal, but as Justice puts it, and I think you ought to listen to him, it's a reminder that the last time America withdrew from its own international security agreement, it led to the most devastating war in history. Oh, and the Department of Homeland Security might hold its opinions in high regard, but it is not entitled to its own alternative facts. Find out why.